Imagine stumbling upon your husband in the garage. You see him lying on the floor, obviously dead. Looking a little closer, you see that he died while rigging a vacuum cleaner hose from the exhaust of the car directly into the trunk. That in itself is strange, but not quite as shocking as popping the trunk and finding three dead people inside. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe. I'm the host, and thank you for joining today. And as I'm finally starting to return to normal, I can talk without sounding like I'm a part grizzly bear. I realize that it's hard to live a life that's fun, funky, and fresh when you can only breathe out of one nostril. And I have to say that I really do appreciate everyone that reached out with all the well wishes and the home remedies for overcoming the flu. Now, a couple of them were about as useful as an ashtray on a motorcycle. Honey and lemon mixed with whiskey? The last thing I want to do is be sick in the bed and also feel like that bed is spinning into outer space because I'm half lit. But I I do appreciate the thought. I did not try that remedy. Maybe it works. Who knows? Before we get going with your story today, this is your reminder to subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts, probably where you're listening right now, and connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media. Links are in the show notes of this episode, as well as at 10minutemurder.com. And what helps the show grow is you telling other people about it. Let your friends and family know if you think they might be into brief true crime stories like the one that you're hearing. Uh, Let them know about 10 Minute Murder. Now, on to today's story. Harriet Carr age 65, in Indianapolis, Indiana, noticed that her garage door was slightly ajar at 4.30 a.m. on April 20th, 1977. That was weird, so she went to go investigate. When she went into the garage, she discovered her husband, Ted, 62 years old, dead on the floor, which we will later learn was from carbon monoxide poisoning. And to her surprise, Harriet saw that her husband wasn't the only person in the garage when she hurried inside to turn off the still-running automobile. Harriet found three dead people in Ted's car's trunk, a woman, a small girl, and a child. The neighbors dialed 911 as Harriet sprinted away from the garage, screaming. The three dead bodies discovered in the trunk were identified as those of Sandra Harris, 17 years old, Karen Mills, 24 years old, and her two-year-old son, Robert. Carbon monoxide poisoning claimed the lives of all three of those in the trunk, and it was discovered that Sandra and Karen had both been sexually assaulted. When the police searched Ted, they found two things on him. One of them was a handkerchief, and the other, a loaded 25 caliber handgun. The car's tailpipe was discovered to be connected to a vacuum cleaner hose that was pointing toward the trunk. The evidence revealed what had taken place. Ted Carr had kidnapped the three victims abused the two ladies sexually, and then forced them into the trunk while holding them at gunpoint. After that, he drove his car into the garage, took a hose from a vacuum cleaner, and put one end of the hose in the trunk and the other end in the tailpipe of the running vehicle. He secured the trunk by locking it. Then he left his victims to die. The two women inside the trunk battled in an effort to escape, breaking their fingernails in the process, according to the deep scratch marks discovered on the inside of the trunk. This was a time before most cars came standard with those trunk release latches on the inside, which, BTW, even now, those latches are not easy to find if you go and look inside your trunk. And they all seem to be in, like, different places. Ted covered his face with a handkerchief before opening the trunk to check if his victims were dead. A handkerchief wasn't quite enough. The quantity of deadly gas that had filled the garage and trunk was too much for Ted's homemade mask. And, in an odd turn of events he also passed out from the fumes. Ted may have been particularly sensitive to the gases due to an undiscovered heart condition, according to the results of his autopsy. So, who was Ted Carr? In 1915, Ted Carr was born in Columbus, Ohio. He was said to have been a quiet kid, but diligent in his youth, earning good grades and rarely getting into trouble. Ted used to spend a lot of time with his father and grandfather during the summers, He developed into a really talented craftsman over time. However, Ted grew older, and following his parents' divorce, 
his behavior significantly changed. Ted was said to have been easy on the eyes and always had one or two girlfriends at all times, according to those that knew him. But Ted also had a temper, particularly with women. While Ted's mother stayed in Ohio, Ted's dad acquired a little service station in Indiana. For a brief period of time, Ted lived with his mother and Virginia, his sister, but quickly got his own place, an apartment on his own and a position working as a part-time carpenter and painter. Ted was married for the first time between 1933 and 1942, but I was unable to find any pertinent details about his first spouse. Ted enlisted in the military in 1942. He married Benny French at that time, and he was stationed in Virginia. The couple filed for divorce just one year later, in 1943. Ted was released from the military service in 1943 and went back to Ohio. To find work as a carpenter, he turned to newspaper advertisements. In Ohio, Ted was introduced to Harriet through a friend. After a few months of dating, they got engaged and then married Harriet, which was his third wife. Harriet was an Ohio State University graduate and a music instructor who also taught in the public school system. Ted ran into legal issues around the beginning of 1945. He was hired by Clara Esser to construct her house, but after she gave him almost $3,000 and saw very little progress, she called the cops on him. Ted was handed over to a grand jury in December of 1946, and in January 1947, he was charged with receiving property under false pretenses. On May 7, 1947, Ted waived the right to a jury trial and had his case heard by a judge instead. And it turns out, Ted had been on the FBI's radar for some time. It was revealed during that trial. He had previously been detained for car theft, carrying a concealed firearm, and writing fraudulent checks as far away as San Francisco. Ted was ultimately found guilty that June. The guilty party often stays behind bars while a thorough inquiry is carried out, but the judge gave Ted a $2,000 bond, allowing him to remain free throughout the investigation. Ted submitted a motion for a new trial three days following his conviction. A court would need to reject his request after eight months. Ted took a lot of trips during those eight months, leaving his wife Harriet by herself in their Ohio house during that time. He was known to have visited Nebraska, Wyoming, Idaho, Texas, Massachusetts, Indiana, and Illinois. Ted was detained in Kimball, Nebraska in October 1947 for kidnapping a husband and wife that were hitchhiking. They were named Robert and Betty Carney. The couple tried to thumb a ride west. They told police that Ted rolled up on them in a brand new Cadillac, pulling a trailer, and asked if they would be interested in working for him at a hunting lodge that he claimed to own in Idaho. Ted Carr identified himself as John Marshall, the same identity that he had previously used in California to write fraudulent checks. The couple claimed that when they decided to work for him, things were good for a short while. Ted provided them with food and blankets to sleep in and conversation throughout the journey, even cracking a few jokes. Ted was kind of funny. Then, as they arrived at a remote road in Kimball, Nebraska, on the third morning, Ted's whole vibe changed. He grabbed a revolver from behind his seat after suddenly becoming upset for no apparent reason. He pulled the car over on a remote road and demanded that the pair get out, or he'd shoot them. He handcuffed Robert to the trailer hitch and violently raped Betty. He used the gun to shoot Robert and Betty in the face, leaving them both bloody and injured, but not dead. Ted hopped back into his Cadillac and took off. A passing driver picked up the couple and drove them to the police station, after Robert and Betty explained what had happened and what Ted looked like, he was soon taken into custody on charges of rape and kidnapping. Unbelievable as it may seem, Ted was once more given a bond. He escaped and returned to Ohio. Finally, the judge turned down Ted's plea for a new trial in February 1948. Ted asked for a postponement twice, and it was granted by the judge twice. That month, Ted and Harriet left Ohio and traveled to Indiana. The Ohio judge, who had approved Ted's bond and adjournments in March of 1948, made the decision to demand payment from Jack Abrams, the man who had signed Ted's $2,000 bond. After the state expended a significant amount of time and resources building its case against Ted, Jack was only assessed a fee of $65, and Ted was later given a warrant. Many years, and no telling how many other victims later, Ted was found by his wife dead on the floor of their garage with three victims in the trunk of his car.